Right. Talk about why, why your book. Well, since it's just going to be, it sounds like it's just going to be you and me with Salem only perhaps occasionally coming in. So I'll think about a follow-up question to your right. intro and then we can keep it going from there. Um, let's see. And um, I believe that we have just gone live. Um, so, all right, um, we'll all get us started. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. Uh, tonight, I am joined by Frederick Swanson and Stephen Trimble. Uh, Frederick H. Swanson writes about the history, exploration, and conservation of public lands in the Western United States, including its national parks, national forests, and wilderness areas. And today, Fred is gonna be chatting with us about his latest book, Wonders of Sand and Stone, A History of Utah's National Parks and Monuments. Um, joining us is also Stephen Trimble, who has published 25 award-winning books, is a writer, editor, and photographer. Um, and he'll be chatting with us in part about the Capital Reef Reader, which is an anthology that he edited. Um, before I turn the time over to the two of them, I just wanted to go over a few of the upcoming events at our bookstore. Uh, Saturday, April 24th is Indie Bookstore Day. Indie Bookstore Day is modeled after Record Store Day and is celebrated by independent bookstores across the nation. We'll have virtual author readings, trivia, and a grown-up story time, as well as, as exclusive merch you can only get on Indie Bookstore Day. And for more information about that, you can visit the event section on our website or our Facebook page. Um, April 28th at 6 p.m. is our virtual Lit Knit, which occurs the second and fourth Wednesday of every month and is open to any kind of craft. If you'd like to attend, uh, please email Catherine with a C at wellerbookworks.com for the Zoom link. Um, and last but not least, on Thursday, April 29th at 7 p.m., we'll be hosting Justin Harnish on YouTube to talk about his book, Meaning in the Multiverse, A Skeptic's Guide to a Loving Cosmos. All right, um, and if anyone in the audience has any questions for Fred or Steve during the event, um, drop them in the YouTube chat box or on our Facebook page and I'll make sure they get asked. Um, right, and now to start us off, I have a question for both Fred and Steve. Um, I'd love if you could tell us a bit about why you care so much about our national parks um, and how this passion led you to work on your books. Thanks. Well, I'll start. And um, I first have to note that it's a good thing Fred has a beard so you can tell us apart. Since we, as I look at these two Zoom pictures here, these two old white guys in their gray sweaters with their glasses, uh, watch for the beard and then you'll know it's Fred. Thanks Salem and thanks to Fred for including me tonight and to everyone at Weller Bookworks as well. Tony and Catherine Weller have poured their lives and hearts into keeping this bookstore going over the generations. My book, The Capital Reef Reader, is all about books. It's an anthology, decades of books about our home territory are squished into this one volume. So many of these books having passed through the Weller shelves. Bookstores are bedrock. So thank you guys for being here. So I am now gonna screen share so I can show you pictures while I talk. And let's see if we can make that work. Um, share. That's the Zoom. Oh, darn. Why is this not working? Okay, I think that, that I believe that that works. Let's hope that it does. I also need to thank the University of Utah Press for publishing this National Park Reader series, <clears throat> of which my book is a part. When the general editors of the series, Dave Stanley and Lance Newman, asked me if I would edit the Capitol Reef volume, of course I said yes. I wasn't going to let anybody else snag this book. And thanks to Dave Livermore and the Nature Conservancy of Utah, who provided us with a grant to run color photographs throughout the book. The Capitol Reef Reader gathers 160 years worth of words 
that capture the spirit of the park and its surrounding landscape in personal narratives, philosophical riffs, and historic and scientific records. I've chosen these more than 50 pieces for the character of their storytelling and language, while I've looked for an array of writing that reveals Capitol Reef in all its layers, from geology to history, from native peoples to 21st century canyoneers. I found pieces that are a pleasure to read and authors who tell us better than anyone else about some aspect of Capitol Reef, including a book edited by Fred Swanson. The reader also includes 100 photos and you'll see some of them tonight. Nearly all of these are my pictures from decades of hiking and photographing here, plus a selection of historic black and whites and a handful from other photographers. So why was I so intent on editing this book? This will take me around to Salem's question, why do I love national parks? Remember that ad campaign during the centennial of the National Park Service in 2016? Choose your park. This is my park. And so this was a labor of love. I arrived in Capitol Reef in 1975 to work a season for the National Park Service as a ranger, knowing only a little. I was 24. I'd work as a park ranger briefly at Arches and for a season in Colorado. I published my first little book for Park Natural History Associations, but I was a newcomer to all things Capitol Reef. This was a long time ago. When I first went out camping that summer, I was sleeping on top of picnic tables because I was afraid of scorpions. But I moved into my little apartment right in the village of Fruta surrounding the visitor center under the big red cliff and began to tune my rhythms to the sunrises and sunsets that lit up that red cliff watching mule deer come down off the mesa every evening, usually after it was dark when I couldn't photograph or on an evening when I didn't have my camera with me. But there was this one evening when these three bucks came along off the mesa and there was enough light and I had my camera and I took a photograph that I've been using for many, many years. I was hired as a seasonal in part to write and photograph for the park. I wrote and photographed a general interpretive book for the Natural History Association, emphasizing the backcountry. I wrote and took pictures for a Hickman Bridge trail guide, both publications long out of print. Though if you've lived in Utah for a while, you might find these artifacts from the past hiding in the far reaches of your bookshelf. But when I write, I research too. So nearly 45 years ago, I began reading everything I could find about the park and I've never stopped. I'm endlessly intrigued with the unending challenge of responding to this place in language in capturing Capitol Reef in words. Capitol Reef turns out to have a surprisingly rich literature and it just keeps going. It's filled with emotion and love. It's alive, this literature. The editors of the Arches and Bryce Canyon volumes in this National Park Reader Series are having a harder time finding the same wealth of writing. And I think I've figured out the reason Capitol Reef turns out to be more passageway than barrier. Archers and Bryce perched by themselves in their spectacular locations off the beaten path. Here, native people use the permanent streams running through the fold as home and as trails for 12,000 years, leaving behind cultural traces and stories. Explorers looked out from Boulder Mountain and then worked their way through the fold along the streams or through the open draws of Cathedral Valley journaling all the while. We go to these same pathways for our hikes. And the only road through central Utah came through Capitol Gorge for nearly a century. Capitol Gorge running right through Capitol Reef. And then the Fremont Canyon Highway replaced it with another through route. These through routes brought travelers and they brought those travelers to Fruta. And they were often writers in those vehicles. Both residents and visiting writers cherish that little village of Fruta with its orchards and its big personalities. Old timers in Fruta self-published their nostalgic memories of both the pioneer Mormon settlers and the eccentric misfits who retired here in the 1940s and 50s. I guess we still attract eccentric misfits to Wayne County. All of this makes for a lot of choices for the editor of the Capital Reef Anthology. And so now I will turn the mic back to Fred. 
Well, thanks, Steve. Wonderful photographs, as always. I've enjoyed seeing your work over the, the years, going back to Blessed by Light and, and your other fine books. Thank you. And I'd, li I'd like to add my, my uh, uh, agreement with what you said about Weller's book works. And you and I both, I think, uh, probably spent a lot of time down in the stacks of when it was Sam Weller's on Main Street. And it's so wonderful that the store is still with us today. Also, uh, uh, to the University of Utah Press, which saw us through both of these volumes and other works as well. Uh, they've, I, I think that the University Press here has contributed so much to our understanding of, of Utah's natural lands over the years. And I'm very pleased to be a little part of that. As far as the question Salem posed about why do we care so much about our national parks? Well, it, it struck me, Steve, that, that you and I both began, introduced each of our books by talking about our first encounters with a national park, a Capitol Reef in your case. It wasn't your first national park, but it was the first time you'd been to Capitol Reef. And with me coming to Arches in the mid 1970s, it seems like those, those early experiences, those first views are, are so formative of our impressions of the parks. And I'd be willing to wager that, that for you, it goes back, to, uh, as for me, to the family vacation and piling into the old station wagon and heading off for a place like Yellowstone or Grand Teton. And for me, like a lot of us, this was really the first experience with, with wild nature that any of us had for me coming from the Midwest. But, but in thinking about, about this whole deal of why do the parks mean so much to us, I, I think there's something more to it. And Ken Burns touched on this in his wonderful series on the national parks on PBS some years ago, that these really represent a national heritage to us, a kind of a common landscape that we share. And I think that's important. Uh, it's almost like, you know, we're citizens of the United States, we have certain freedoms, but we also have this title to some land that we have in common. And I, I think that comes out so strongly when, when you're standing at some overlook down at Bryce and there's people from all these nations around you and you realize, wow, you know, here I'm an American and I get to share this, my lands, I get to share with them. So, so that's been important to me as well. And as far as the genesis of my book, it, it really goes back to that Ken Burns series. My wife and I watched that and, and I was really struck by how Burns and his writer Dayton Duncan wove all these stories, these journals that they'd somehow come up with of people's experiences in all of our national parks, so very moving accounts. Uh, there, one that particularly struck me was the artist uh, Chiuru Obata, who fell in love with Yosemite and, and talked of the great nature there. So at the conclusion of that series, I thought, boy, you know, we need something like this for Utah. And I was uh, motivated to put together an adult education course for the Osher Institute up at the University of, of Utah, the Institute for Lifelong Learning. And I taught that for several semesters uh, uh, to a, a group of people who you know, had a variety of experiences in our national parks. And by the end of that, I realized that from my notes and the images I'd collected that I had the beginnings of a book. Uh, of course, it took me about three more years to write it, but ultimately uh, the University of Utah Press agreed to publish it and that's how this came about. And, and I hope that it fills a bit of a gap because I was surprised to learn that there had not been a single volume that draws together all of the history of these different national parks, national monuments, and other protected lands for, for a very long time. And I thought that could be a useful thing to do instead of simply the individual histories of each parks, which, which of course exist. So that's the genesis of this project, and uh, in many ways it mirrors what you were doing. 
I was really intrigued with the way you structured your book, Fred, because anyone picking up that book would sort of expect, here's the Candylands chapter, here's the Arches chapter, here's the Zion chapter. That's not what you did. You take us through the sweep of history, telling the stories of the parks as you do so, and you do some looping back and forth in time. But could you talk a little bit more about your decisions to split up the crucial moments and the interesting characters and sprinkle them through several chapters for each part? Well, I'm glad you liked how it came out, Steve, because there's a certain risk in doing that, uh, of just coming up with a mishmash. <laughs> but I, I think what was at the heart of that, well, well you touched on, it's the whole sweep of history of our national parks. There's, there's common themes, there's common uh, individuals involved in, in building our national park system. And I, I thought it would be useful to tell the story in that way. A another reason, and this, this was also part of my motivation was, I really wanted to show how these individual park units, Zion, Bryce, Capitol Reef, Arches, Canyonlands, and all of our national monuments were part of a much larger landscape, the Colorado Plateau landscape. And of course, we have outliers like, like Tempanogos Cave up in the, the Wasatch Range, but generally our parks fall within this Colorado Plateau region. And that, that region represents, as, as you well know, uh, so much more than just these, these pinnacles of scenery in our national park. And I thought that by trying to give this regional approach that it would show how our parks fit into this overall context. And, and that leads to a whole other set of questions about how that larger landscape uh, is being managed as well. Absolutely. Well, really all of Southern Utah could be one big national park. We know that. And there was this legendary proposal that pretty much proposed exactly that back in the 1930s, the Escalante National Monument proposal, which you feature in your story in really the best and most complete detail I've ever read. I loved it. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that visionary park that didn't reach fruition in the 30s and set the stage for later landscape scale parks like Canyonlands and Grand Staircase and Bears Ears? That has a lot to do with what's happening now, I think with our vision of big preserves. And uh, whatever surprised you as you researched that story, I'm sure you found some things that you didn't know about as well. Yes, yeah, so it's a, an amazing chapter in our park history. When, when uh, in 1936, seemingly out of the blue, the National Park Service unveiled this proposal for a national monument that would have been twice the size of Yellowstone there in southeastern Utah in the Canyonlands. The, the so-called Escalante National Monument, four and a half million acres, uh, 7,000 square miles. It was an astonishing proposal and I, I was always curious, who came up with this? Who, who is the person behind it? And unfortunately, the Park Service uh, in, in a fit of house cleaning back in the 1970s managed to throw out most of the written record of the Escalante. So what we know about it I've had to piece together from, from anecdotal accounts and little bits here and there. But as near as we can tell, it was a proposal that originated from one individual, Roger Toll, who was the Park Service's designated point man for exploring potential new parks in the 1930s. And as I describe in the book, he, he took a trip up onto the slopes of Boulder Mountain in the fall of 1933 in the company of uh, Ephraim Pechtel, a prominent uh, leader there in the town of, of your town of Torrey. And like anyone who has been up on the slopes of Boulder Mountain, he was just bowled over by that vista off to the east, clear off to Navajo Mountain. And I think, and some other historians agree with me, that, that uh, it opened his eyes and ultimately the Park Service's eyes to the potential for new monuments in southeastern Utah. Well, it was a grand visionary proposal, but it was probably premature. There was tremendous opposition from ranchers, from water power interests, from Utah state government, and it just went nowhere. 
but it did lead to ultimately, I think, to proposals for Canyonlands, for Cap Capitol Reef, the studies that the Park Service began as a part of the Escalante Monument, they continued through World War II. And ultimately this led to new proposals which uh, came to fruition in, in places like Canyonlands. So it, it may have been too early, but I don't think it was wasted effort. And uh, of course, as you mentioned, we're seeing an effective replay of many of those same issues with, with uh, Bears Ears and Grand Staircase. So, so maybe at this point, Steve, I can, I, I can uh, ask you a question about, uh, with, with your long acquaintance with Capitol Reef, uh, you've seen a lot of changes over the years, I'm sure, since you arrived in, what was it, 1976, did you say? And um, I'm curious, what was it like as a young ranger back then? Uh, were, were, uh, were tourists the same as they are now? I mean, there were a lot fewer of them. What have you seen change over the years? You know, not as much as you might think in some ways, and everything is the other answer. Um, one thing that I have to mention as a change fits right into what you were saying <clears throat> about the view from Boulder Mountain that inspired Roger Toll. You know, when I talk about Capitol Reef in the book, I don't stick to the park boundaries. You know, I start Capitol Reef Country with that very same view from Boulder Mountain, which was the first view that the white explorers had of the central portion of the water pocket fold. <clears throat> and every one of them who looked out there was inspired. You know, the most beautiful writing we have in some ways comes from that view that the John Wesley Powell geologist Clarence Dutton described when he looked out in the 1880s and Wallace Stegner dreamed of uh, memories of his youth when he began to write the wilderness letter to write about the idea of wilderness. He was imagining the view from Boulder Mountain and uh, that led him to write his, his way into that last line of the wilderness letter to talk about the geography of hope. So when I was a ranger at Capitol Reef, the road over Boulder Mountain was still dirt and it was an adventure and Notum Road was still dirt and the Burr Trail was all dirt. And I took my old beat up 1962 Dodge Dart on all those roads and a lot of other roads where I should not have taken it and uh, had my adventures in what felt still like my own personal playground. You know, I did not see a lot of people back there. And obviously there are far more people now, you know, visitation in a non COVID year is well over a million, but they're still going to the main designated places, you know, people, visit national parks largely as novices to wild country and they trust the rangers and the rangers send them to Hickman Bridge Trail and the scenic drive and the stroll through Capitol Gorge in Grand Wash. And so once you get beyond those places here at this park, just as you get beyond Zion Canyon and go up on the East Rim or the West Rim or wander off into the Navajo sandstone on your way to Delicate Arch at Arches, but not yet all the way to Delicate Arch. You know, it's really easy still to be by yourself. And so there are more tourists, there are more visitors, and they're certainly um, more plugged in. You know, they're gonna be taking pictures and posting them on Instagram rather than taking slides and getting them developed when they come back home and waiting for the little yellow boxes to arrive in the mail of their developed slides. Uh, so instant gratification, instant sharing, and obviously the problems that come with those Instagram pictures if they're geotagged and start attracting hundreds of thousands of people to places that can't handle them just to get that one picture. You know, it's pretty hard to be at a, alone at Delicate Arts these days. Even the full moon night, you won't be alone. Maybe on a new moon night, you might be alone, but it's, um, it's still remarkable how easy it is to get away from those crowds. Good point, Steve, and I'm, I'm glad you said that. And I still miss those little yellow boxes of slides that come in and you get together with the family and see which pictures turned out. But to follow up a little bit on this, this question, and this, this relates, I think, back even to the Escalante Monument, that when you came to Capitol Reef, 
the monument had only been expanded seven, eight years previously in 1969, and it was a huge expansion that quadrupled the size of the monument, clear down the water pocket fold and up into Cathedral Valley. Um, did you talk much with local people then? Were you hearing that there was still much discontent over that, or were people getting more reconciled to the fact that this was going to be a, a big, uh, and ultimately a, a big national park, not just a monument? I'm gonna to switch to some slides to answer your question. I've got a few slides that help to illustrate that story. And so let me see if I can figure out how to do that successfully. Um, when I get back to the right part of my script and let me uh, go back to screen sharing. See here. I'm not as adept at this as I should be. Ah, okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> I even practiced this. Here we go. This is working now. Okay, as you said, Fred, Capitol Reef started off as quite a small national monument in 1937. After the big Escalante proposal died, there was this um, grand celebration in Grand Wash. You can see all those cars parked there. And that was a monument that was really driven by local enthusiasm. The boosters of Wayne County called it Wayne Wonderland National Park. And Ephraim Pechtel, who you already mentioned, and Joseph Hickman pushed for that Wayne County National, Wayne Wonderland National Park to boost the Wayne County economy. What they got in 1937 was that small national monument that remained unfunded for decades and was even open to uranium mining in the 1950s. But then there was this amazing moment when Park Superintendent Bob Hyder was asked by Stuart Udall to draw boundaries to expand that monument sixfold in 1968. And Hyder actually asked his wife to secretly type up his proposal because his secretary at Capitol Reef was Afton Taylor, the wife of Wayne County rancher Don Taylor, and Hyden didn't want to blow his cover. But he took the monument, which had been this small little area right around Fruta in the central part of the water pocket fold, and expanded it to the light line here six times, all the way up to Cathedral Valley, all the way down to the southern part of the park, which is now the park, of course, past the Burr Trail. And uh, President Lyndon Johnson made that map real when he signed an executive order while dressing for Richard Nixon's inauguration. Here in Southern Utah, not everyone was pleased. Uh, Johnson did that as one of his very last acts. He essentially signed the the proclamation while I was putting on his pants for the inauguration. Boulder Town over the mountain briefly changed its name to Johnson's Folly and Protest, but nonetheless within two years Congress made Capitol Reef a national park and the heavy line on that map uh, shows you the park that protected the park all the way down to Halls Creek including Halls Creek Narrows, perhaps the most spectacular place in the park and also the most remote. And today, after that sequence of events, Capitol Reef gets more than a million visitors a year. You asked how the controversies were going when I came. Uh, Capitol Reef had only been a national park for four years when I started working as a ranger. And I walked into another controversy, which actually is still ongoing. And that's the decision on, about whether or not to pave the Burr Trail the old mining road that, well, originally a ranching road and then a mining road that switched back up over the fold and then wanders its way over to the town of Boulder across the Circle Cliffs, which we hope will soon be restored to once again be part of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And the counties, uh, Garfield County and Wayne County, have been determined to 
paved that road over the years. You know, it's a spectacular place. It takes you right through these big high cliffs. And what we have now is paved roads coming up to the park from every direction, but within the park, the road is still dirt. And in the anthology, I include a piece written by Jared Farmer from his book, Glen Canyon Dam, that tells the story of the Bird Trail controversy. And he mentioned this graffiti on the Bird Trail where it crosses the gulch over uh, closer to Boulder and uh, mentioned that, mentions seeing that years and years and years ago, keep it like it was. And I realized when I read his piece that I had a picture of that very same graffiti and was able to find that in my files and include it in the book. The Burr Trail is still in the courts. We just had a decision this very week saying that uh, the renegade paving done by the county with virtually no permission, just barely permission from the BLM on the bullfrog side of the park was legal. They had actual permission to do that. So. I think we're, we now are at a place where there isn't too much more to fight over. The Park Service is determined to keep the bird trail dirt and continue to have that little bit of dirt trail, dirt road adventure. But um, things have changed. You know, in those early days, part of the, of the hatred of the park came from uh, a character you write about in your book, Charlie Kelly, who was the first superintendent and was just not a nice man. He was a member of the Ku Klux Klan he hated members of the Mormon church. He was a, really a terrible pick in some ways to be superintendent of Capitol Reef, the first superintendent. And yet he was a good historian. He wrote books about the park. We used his research about the park for decades really, but he alienated a lot of the local folks and there was still a lot of, of uh, discomfort and resentment toward the park that in part stemmed from that one personality. And more recently, superintendents have often lived in town gone to Rotary Club meetings, been much nicer people, things are better. Those, uh, those early photographs are, are amazing. There's some there I haven't seen of the uh, inauguration of the monument. Those are great. Uh, but what you just touched on, Steve, I think is so important, the, the relationship that National Park staff have had with local people over the years. And uh, you asked me what what surprised me in, in about uh, doing the research on this book, and I think a lot of it was just how closely uh, the the early day uh, staff, rangers, custodians in the National Park Service worked with people in Utah to try to cement those good relations, and uh, perhaps let well, this might be actually a good time to to show a few photos myself of uh, some of those early day rangers and, and how they contributed to, to good relationships between local people and the, and the public. So I'll go ahead with that. Always holding one's breath. So I thought I'd just throw in uh, some early day photographs I came across on Park Service archives of Capitol Reef when it was a national monument. And uh, that lower left photo is probably also from Capitol Wash or possibly further up. I don't know if that could be the Sulphur Creek Road. But when you, okay. When you look back in the early days of the National Park Service in Utah, uh, the, the rangers who were the face of the Park Service on the ground were so important. One of the first was Walter Roosh in Zion, who was actually appointed as a custodian. That was a, a kind of a sub-ranger position in the early days for national monuments. Uh, Zion was initially a national monument. He was appointed in 1917 to keep a watch on, on uh, what was still a, a rather small designation there in Zion Canyon. And he, he was a local person. He'd actually been working as a maintenance uh, uh, person uh, taking care of some road equipment. But Horace Albright, the number two man in the Park Service thought he saw something in this guy. And he turned out to be very dedicated. He worked uh, hard to, uh, he worked with local farmers and ranchers to try to get cattle removed from Zion. 
and was uh, successful in doing that with the aid of uh, David Hershey, the, the LDS bishop there in Rockville. So it helped Zion get off to a good start when it became a national park in 1919. The, the first permanent ranger at Bryce Canyon was a fellow named Maurice Cope. And his duties included everything that needed done in, at Bryce Canyon, which was designated a, a, a national monument in 1923 and became a national park only a few years later. Uh, he had to do road repairs, uh, fix the water supply, chop firewood for the campers, as well as lead ranger hikes, as you can see here. Uh, so these were really jack of all trades and they, they, uh, they helped to, to cement these good relationships, I think, with, with the local populace. The ranger talks were a key part, of course, of the outreach of the National Park Service then as, as today. And uh, what it would have been like to have been up there under the pines of Bryce, listening to uh, Maurice or some other individuals with the Park Service talk about the, the landscape, the biota, all of those things. One of the really fascinating characters that I came across was Ezekiel Johnson, who also was appointed custodian at Natural Bridges in 1923 over in southeastern Utah. And here's a case of a guy that was just working for the love of the job. Uh, he, he was a native Utahan. He had been a, a part-time rancher, a prospector, doing all the different kinds of work that you had to do to make a living down there. And his job at Natural Bridges came with the munificent salary of a dollar a month initially. But what he did have was the rights to guide people into the backcountry. And so he kind of used Natural Bridges as his home base for pack trips out into the larger region. But uh, Johnson took a, a, a real sense of pride and concern at Natural Bridges. Uh, here he is with a rock formation known as the Goblet of Venus, which was actually outside of Natural Bridges, and unfortunately was vandalized and destroyed in the 1940s. But Johnson kept a close eye on people who went down to the three Natural Bridges in White Canyon. And if he found that someone had left their names or had scrawled something on the rocks, he would go track them down. Often they weren't too hard to find and he would make them he would persuade them to come back and remove their names. So this was real hands-on rangering in those days. And I don't think any story of Utah's national parks would be complete without talking about Bates Wilson, who was, uh, was a national monument. And he, more than any other individual, I think, was responsible for calling attention to the Canyonlands landscape and helping that become a national park. Uh, Jen Quintano has written a wonderful book on Bates Wilson called Blow Sand in the Soul. And that describes Wilson pretty well. He was out in the field all the time. As you can see here, he often uh, eschewed his national park uniform for jeans and a Stetson. And he also worked hard to um, represent the Park Service in Moab. He was a member of the Rotary, went to public meetings. He was always being called on to explain what the Park Service was up to in the area. But more than anything, he would take people out into the backcountry. And he was known for his uh, Dutch oven dinners and for passing around a bottle around the campfire. And in, in this way, he, he helped uh, uh, lubricate, you might say, the, the uh, prospects for getting a Canyonlands National Park, which we did in 1964. So uh, really, I just have a few slides here, but I thought I'd end with a modern day ranger. I, I don't know this person's name, but uh, she's doing what I think is one of the most critical tasks that the Park Service undertakes and that is interpreting our natural heritage for all of us and especially for young people. Uh, 
my family, my wife and I, when we had our daughter, we started visiting our national parks more. We found that they were wonderfully kid-friendly places. And I think our daughter, uh, who isn't shown here, uh, collected something like 13 junior ranger badges in various national, spreading the word of the importance of national parks, of the, the biology, the cultural history. And I just want to give a shout out to all of the national park rangers who do these programs. It is a, a critical uh, job. And I think it's what leads us all to appreciate the wonder that's found in our national parks. So I will end that right here. When I was a kid, when, when I was a kid and my parents were taking me to national parks, I decided that park rangers were rock stars and I wanted to be one. And uh, it was really kind of remarkable that I did find myself about two years after I read Desert Solitaire and a year after I graduated from college, I was a ranger at Arches. Lucky. Um, I wanted to, um, I wanted to actually, I'm gonna read this question to you, Fred, because I'm gonna quote you in it. So I wanna get it right. You know, you end your book with an eloquent plea which kind of, kind of follows along with what you're, you were just saying about rangers. Uh, you end your book with an eloquent plea for preserving the chance to experience, as you put it, knowledge, beauty, mystery, and wonder in Utah's national parks. You sound an awful lot like Edward Abbey ranting against industrial tourism and desert solitaire when you write, if we do not halt the transformation of Southern Utah's canyons and plateaus into an industrialized and over-touristed landscape, their quietude, expansiveness, and mystery will vanish. So did, did you come away from immersing yourself in this history, in these stories, with a sense of hope about the future, with a sense that we can indeed show restraint and build resilience as we grapple with values resistant to change, values resistant to fact, as we grapple with too many people, as we grapple with inevitable climate catastrophe? How do you maintain your hope? Big question, Steve. That's, that's one to really mull over. I think uh, all of us who have spent time in our, our wilderness and park landscapes face that question. Uh, more and more people coming to them, more and more impacts, and then looming over it all this issue of climate change, this climate emergency that we face, the loss of biodiversity. How do you maintain hope? I sometimes have to sit back and kind of take inventory of, of what I do see happening. One of those things is I see a whole lot of young people in our parks and our wilderness areas. Um, I'm sure you've read Richard Louv's book on, on uh, Last Child in the Woods, and, and uh, there's been concern that uh, the younger generations are spending all their time in front of a, a screen. And, well, I'm not sure I see that out in the, the wilderness. What I see is a lot of people in their 20s, people starting families, uh, bringing their kids out to these places. It's like they realize it's important and they want their children to see it. So that's a point of hope that I see. Uh, I see a lot of hope in the emergence of Native American voices in, in uh, our national park lands. So we see that not only at Bears Ears, which was a Native American a tribal proposal, but in, in many park landscapes around the country uh, where they, they um, want or, or perhaps are demanding a voice in the management of these areas. And I think that's to the good. Um, maybe more broadly, the, the uh, hope I see just in the terms of the number of people who still appreciate and want to see our national parks. And sure, maybe they're posting their photos on Instagram instead of popping their slides in a carousel tray like you and I did. But somewhere in behind of all that, I think is still that same desire for a sense of wonder, a sense of appreciation of what's out there. If we, if we can channel that interest into productive terms, if we can show people that 
more is at stake than just individual national parks. It's a whole region. We need to talk about things like connectivity of landscapes um, and, and again and again, the importance of maintaining biodiversity. Uh, we can't let even the climate change discussion snuff the, the, uh, the oxygen out of that debate. So yes, uh, challenges, but uh, you know, back in the 1970s, it looked like Utah's national parks were going to be turned into an industrial landscape. The Kaiparowicz proposal, you remember that, for a huge power generating plant. Uh, the the uh, Trans Canyon Parkway that was going to extend from, from Colorado clear through all of uh, southeastern Utah, those were defeated by what was then a very uh, small and uh, low budget environmental movement here in Utah. So we've seen issues before and they've been, been uh, grappled with. So I think we can, can uh, try to do that today. Those are Im super important things to mention. And I think they are the things that give us hope. I worry a little bit that those a lot of those young people are not backpacking, not reading natural history books, but here for adventure, you know, for canyoneering, for mountain biking, for trail running, wonderful things to do that do connect them with the with the land. Um, but some of them don't really know where they are. And there are a few, there are a few amazing people. Morgan, Morgan Shogren is one who is a runner, now writing really good natural history as well. And I hope that she's able to suck in some of those adventures and remind them that. These are places they need to learn about and help to save. Uh, your mention of bear's ears and native participation is crucial too. You know, I think we're very close to seeing the restoration of bear's ears and the return of co-management to the bear's ears intertribal coalition. There's a really good article in the current issue of the Atlantic. They've studied a series on the meaning of wilderness and the lead article is, let's turn all of the national parks over to tribes and let them manage them. And I read the article and I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. If we fund them properly, they would do so much remarkable education about native history, which so few people, so few people know, and native connections to landscape. And they do all the other things that the normal park service does perfectly well. So I, I think that's a great idea. But um, at every park, people are reaching out making a point of saying, here we are on Paiute and Ute land, stolen land, and reaching out to the local tribes, no matter how tiny or far from, from their old ways they might be, there's still, there's still remnants of those traditional connections to landscape in every tribe. And so that's, that's crucially important. The, uh, the things you said about connectivity, of course, lead us into the 30 by 30 vision you know, trying to preserve 30% of North America by 2030 and do that so we have that resilience in the face of climate change and the loss of biodiversity. And national parks will be key to that. Uh, the big question, of course, is what does, what does preserve land mean? You know, regular old BLM land and regular old Forest Service land isn't enough. We have to have a, a higher level of protection. And we're going to be moving into a an exciting and controversial time trying to work that out. Absolutely, Steve. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that 30 by 30 initiative. You know, we could talk about this for two more hours, but I wonder if uh, we want to uh, see what if Salem has some questions for us. I think that's a great idea. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I do have a couple of questions for the both of you. Um, my first one, uh, Fred. In your book, you describe the Colorado Plateau as a blank slate upon which awestruck and reverential visitors register their own impressions. And you talk a bit about how different cultures have connected with the landscape through spiritual, architectural, and artistic lenses. And Steve, one of the excerpts that you include in your book is from Robert McPherson, who writes about the discovery of three pectal shields in Capitol Reef which he mentions have been used to prove the validity of LDS temple ceremonies, Native American ceremonies, and Masonic rituals. 
And so th this is a little bit abstract, but my question for the both of you is, if you could each speak a little bit more about the subjectivity of these landscapes and the role that language and metaphor play in helping people connect with them. Steve, you want to tackle that? That's uh, one to cogitate on. Yeah, for sure. That's a big question. Um, we're all completely sub subjective, right? And so we, um, we come to these places with everything we know and we learn whatever we're going to learn and that's the way we see them. That's the way we interpret them. And so uh, Bishop Pechtol, who lived in Torrey in the 20s and 30s was a devout LDS man. And when he went out digging up artifacts as he did in the days before people knew that wasn't a great idea if you weren't an archeologist, he found these three amazing three foot across buffalo hide shields. And I tell the story of those shields in the anthology using Bob McPherson, McPherson's uh, version of that. And those shields can be seen by everyone who looks at them differently. Uh, Bishop Pechtol thought they, as, as you said, Salem, thought they proved some of the stories in the Book of Mormon. And uh, when it came time to ask the tribes what to do with them after the Native, Grave, Native American Graves and Repatriation Act in the 1990s, when we began to repatriate objects like that, the shields had been on display in the park for years. Every tribe in, who had any connection to Capitol Reef said, well, surely they must be ours because that was our territory. But John Holliday, a Navajo medicine man who was nearing 100 years old, knew exactly what those shields were. He knew who made them. He knew who made them seven generations back and every Navajo medicine man, the name of every Navajo medicine man, right through those generations who had been the caretakers of those shields until the until little bitter water man buried them at the time that Kit Carson was rounding up Navajos and sending them to a concentration camp in Eastern New Mexico in 1864, and then died before he could tell anyone where they were. And so it was Pechtol who found them. And when the Park Service heard that story from John Holliday, they said, they surely belong to the Navajo people, to the Diné, and they now reside in the Navajo Tribal Museum. So the shields themselves kind of capture that story of subjectivity when we, when each of us comes to a park today, you know, I talked about the young people or, or old people too, for that matter, who come just for adventure and don't really care about all the history in Fred's book or all the literature in my book. They just want to soak up the place, have an adventure and move down the road. And uh, so I think all of the, the words in our books that help us understand the context and the history and the way that brilliant writers have seen these places, that gives you the metaphor to make sense out of a challenging landscape. It's so true. And one of the things I really appreciated about uh, your book and, and all of the accounts that you collected was how, how many artists and writers are represented in it. And all of these different perspectives that have changed over time and even people we don't think of as, as uh, artists necessarily, we're, we're talking about this idea of the landscape as a blank canvas. Um, I, I was so glad that you included a piece by Ward Roylance, who was uh, one of the uh, first individuals I met when I first went down to Capitol Reef. And, and uh, I just, I marked this and I just wanted to, to, to read this very short quotation because I think it's germane to this. He, he talks about, about it, this is for a pamphlet that he wrote back in the 1970s for the National Park Service at Capitol Reef. And he asked the question, what is it that makes this place so special? And he goes through all of the standard answers of you know, the magnificent geology and the, the, uh, the types of landforms, which as he pointed out, are not unique. Uh, there's something different in a place like Capitol Reef. And his take is that no, the uniqueness of Capitol Reef National Park lies not merely in its basic geologic constituents, however remarkable they may be. The secret of its sublimity 
is in the blending, the polishing, the finishing. Any work of art requires raw materials. What transforms materials into art is some creative force. I just love that, the, the blending, polishing, and finishing. We, we know how sand does that on a slick rock surface, but he's talking about something in a, in a larger scale, I think. I love that you read that piece from Ward Roy Lance. Um, you know, he, he was dismissed as sort of a, a travel bureau writer for a long time, but he wrote some of the very best stuff about Capitol Reef. He loved this place. And of course, it's, for, it's his former home that's now the Infrata Institute in Torrey. So back to Salem for another question. Yeah, thank you both so much. Those were beautiful answers. Um, I have an audience question for both of you. Uh, you both mentioned that some of these parks began as small areas like Capitol Reef and Zion and were later expanded to landscape, landscape scale parks. Why do you think that that is a commonality and how might that be instructive in the current national monument debates? Well, you, uh, if, if I can start off with that, um, Utah is a little unique in that the, the initial national monuments and parks that were designated here were fairly small. Uh, Zion, Bryce Canyon, we're talking a few tens of thousands of acres. And it wasn't really until the uh, creation of Canyonlands in 1964 that we had uh, what I would call a lands landscape scale park. And that was a hard sell to uh, the political leaders in Utah. There was a long, bitter three-year debate over Canyonlands about how big it would be. I was surprised to learn that the initial proposal for Canyonlands was a million acres. It was going to extend rim to rim from the uh, orange cliffs on the west to the Hatch Point cliffs on the east. And that got whittled down and down and down to a quarter of that size. Uh, there, there was one expansion since then. So, so these struggles over defining the size of a national park are by no means new. And Canyonlands, I think, anticipated many of the same issues that, that we're dealing with now as Secretary Haland is, is touring Bears Ears and uh, Grand Staircase Escalante. But what we have today, I think, is new knowledge, better knowledge about the importance of the biological constituents of these landscapes, their, their importance as, as cultural heritage sites, and that, that, and that culture means not just a rock inscription here or a stone tower here, but the whole context in which Native peoples were working. Everything is pointing toward larger landscapes, connected landscapes. It ain't easy. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to that. I think those of us like you, Steve, who've been writing about these issues for so long, we have a, a difficult and continuing job to, to point out the need for these places. And as you say, to, to make it clear to people who may not uh, have dipped their toes into those issues of why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Utah, there is no other place like Utah um, it's this weird combination of an a land, a land we, we had the heart of the Colorado Plateau by chance. You know, the straight lines on the map that define the four corner states are pretty arbitrary, but we have the heart of the heart. We have the Canyonlands province of the Colorado Plateau almost completely within Utah. And as I said earlier, it, all, it really all could be one big national park um, in terms of its value biologically and culturally and scientifically and scenically. And then we have a traditional culture in Utah that, that started with a group of folks that were chased across the country by federal troops and still harbor great resentment toward the federal government. And public lands get lumped in with the federal government. And so preservation of public lands is anathema to many elected officials with power in Utah. And yet, Small towns in southern Utah are trying to make their economy grow. They're trying to make a living. And they, they started by pushing for small preserves that would attract tourists, not big preserves that would eliminate mining and, and perhaps grazing, but 
They wanted a small Zion, a small Bryce, a small Wayne Wonderland, a small Arches, uh, in hopes that their economy would grow with tourism. But when you start to talk about big parks, then you run into that real anathema, real antipathy toward public lands that's really greater in Utah than in any other state, maybe Wyoming or Nevada, but I think probably greater than any other state here. And we're headed into a time when, you know, science is understanding more and more that we're in crisis and we need the connectivity that Fred talks about that connects the Grand Canyon through the high plateaus to the Wasatch and the Uintas and the Wyoming Ranges and Greater Yellowstone and the Crown of the Continent and Yellowstone and Yukon for all those animals and migration paths. We need refugia for animals to survive in the face of climate change. We need big preserves to do that. And there's a chance to really kind of bring to fruition all of the big dreams for big preserves in Southern Utah in the course of making those, those decisions about how to, how to keep our animals that we live with, how to, how to keep our animal companions with us and not have nearly all of them go extinct. You know, think about your own experiences when you were younger and there were more animals out there. You know, I haven't seen a canyon tree frog in a pothole in a side canyon in years and years. And I used to dearly love them. I hear fewer canyon wrens. You know, there are uh, pinion jays, which I love, have decreased 70% in population in the last 50 years. You know, we are losing uh, the natural world and we need to take action. And big preserves and big preserves on the Colorado Plateau will help immensely in doing that. Well said. Salem? Yeah, thank you both so much. Um, in the last few minutes we've got here, um, I just have one more question for the both of you, and that is, uh, how can individuals assist in the protection and conservation of our public lands, and do either of you have some resources that you'd like to share with our audience? You want to start, Fred? Sure. Excellent question. Of course, it's important to support organizations that are working to protect our national parks. Uh, the National Parks Conservation Association, uh, the, uh, I've been a member of the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance for a long time, uh, and there are, there are many others. On an individual level, talking to your friends. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of uh, posts on Facebook, and I, I try to uh, most of those are kind of soft focus, nice pictures and flowers and things, but I try once in a while to put in a little, little comment about biodiversity. Uh, there are many avenues. Uh, mine happens to be the written word. Maybe you're a photographer like Steve and can, uh, can share images with people. Uh, and just keeping an eye out, uh, the, the climber who down the north of Arches who noticed that somebody had bolted a root next to an ancient uh, a pictograph or petroglyph and uh, called the guy on it. Uh, that's an example of, of, of being vigilant for what's happening down there. Steve? All of those things are important, absolutely. Um, I'd also mention the Grand Canyon Trust, another wonderful organization working on important conservation issues on the plateau, across the plateau. <clears throat> uh, you'll find a lot of uh, good writing and ideas on Fred's website and my website as well. If you can write, uh, you know, even just very straightforwardly writing about your own passions, send letters to the editor, send op-eds to the press and make it clear that there are citizens out here that care. Uh, anytime you get riled up, fire off a letter to the editor. They're, uh, they're the most heavily read part of the paper other than the sports pages and the comics. And so they matter. Um, but more than anything, I'd say talk to people. You know, when you go to a small town and you go to the hamburger joint, you know, strike up a conversation, make it clear that, that if you're in, in Grand Staircase, you support the restoration of the full boundaries. Uh, if, if you're at Bears Ears, go to the Bears Ears Information Center in Bluff and educate yourself and find out what the tribes have to say and make sure that you know about proper behavior when you're around cultural sites, the, the, the astonishing cultural sites at Bears Ears. Um, learn about biological soil crust and make sure that you 
protect that incredible surface of the soil that protects it from erosion, protects it from blowing into the, the snow over in the San Juan Mountains in Colorado and darkening the snow and absorbing too much heat and leading to way too early snow melt. Um, your ATV, our ATVs and bicycle tracks in biological soil crust in Utah in Northern Arizona determine how much water there is in Los Angeles the next year. So everything is connected and um, follow the news, support the Secretary of the Interior as she recommends big conservation ideas to the Biden administration. And um, you know, let, it, let our elected officials know it's, it's hard when we're dealing with elected officials that have very different ideas, but the more they believe that their, their voters care about this stuff, the more they will begin to adopt those positions. So join organizations, talk to people, talk to each other, and um, make a lot of noise. Thank you both so much. Um, this was absolutely wonderful. It was very informative and a lot of fun. Um, anybody in the audience, uh, if you enjoyed our conversation, please consider supporting Fred and Steve by buying copies of their books. Um, please consider supporting our bookstore by buying them through us. Um, and we will have signed copies of both books by next week. Um, so be sure to drop in if, if you'd like one of those. And yeah, again, thank you both so much for your time. I hope that you both have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Salem. Thank you for having us, Salem. Thanks to independent bookstores. They are our lifeblood, an important part of American culture. <laughs>